uh, Peter Vitek <laughs> uh, will speak to us about things we don't talk about in quantum machine learning. Okay, that's great. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, before before I start, um, I would like to gather some statistics. So how many uh, how many of you are here on a quantum machine learning conference or workshop for the first time? I apparently have to stop some classical error correction going on. Is it better? Okay, so how many of you are here for the first time? Okay, okay, welcome, welcome. You know, always happy to new, see new faces. Um, how many of you have been to any conference or workshop related to quantum physics? Yeah, most of you. How many of you have been to a classical machine learning workshop? A handful of you, that's actually more than I expected. Okay, very good, very good. So, um, you know, I, by making some terrible life choices, I, I ended up being unemployed and uh, homeless. Actually, I don't have a country of residence, and I'm Eastern European, so actually I have nothing to lose. And because of that, I feel that, you know, I can say whatever I want. And that's, that's why I thought I would talk about things we don't talk about machine learning. Um, so let me start with um, highlighting an interesting process. We are, we are being institutionalized. Just, just two days ago, the American Statistical Association approved the creation of a special interest group in quantum machine learning, which is brilliant because you know, we talk about an intersection between computer science and quantum physics, and it's the statistics association that creates a special interest group, but it's happening. And then, you know, right now we have two quantum machine learning workshops at the same time, one here and one in Heidelberg. And, uh, well, actually we have N plus one more workshops coming up just this year alone, you know. So there are like, like seven, eight events related to quantum machine learning a year. Um, the third book on quantum machine learning is going to be published in a couple of months. And this is going to be the first book on quantum machine learning, which is actually worth reading. So, you know, good news. And the first book on quantum machine learning is being translated to Japanese. And it's being translated for, for a year now, which is amazing because I happen to know that it took seven months to write it, and apparently it takes twice as long to translate it to Japanese. Um, a more specialized journal is coming up. So now we are creating a new journal for you know, publishing quantum machine learning papers. And I'm really looking forward to it because once that happens, like anybody who dares to submit a classical machine learning paper to this journal, you know, we can just write a scathing editorial rejection. Don't take this paper. Um, we are starting to have fights for this field about, you know, and, and the fantastic thing is that there are many quantum physicists here. So, you know, there's, there's soon going to be a conference series dedicated to the foundations of quantum machine learning and like the interpretations of quantum machine learning and all that. It's gonna be fun. And, uh, you know, many people just use FMI search for MATLAB and they say that, hey, we do quantum machine learning. So we have to get rid of that, for instance. And it's really fun to look at the edit history of the Wikipedia page on, on quantum machine learning, especially when there are reverse changes. So, you know, there, there are these subtle small fights of what this field actually is. And, uh, well, we even have a website. And if that wasn't enough, we even have a LinkedIn group with 239 members and one person who posts things there on a regular basis. I happen to know this person very well. Um, more statistics. So, um, I studied how many papers appeared uh, on quantum machine learning. And the way I count it is that I ordered things in my, in my quantum machine learning papers folder by time, and then I just you know, counted them. So it's not a very scientific method of calculating it. Well, you know, in 2014, there were 20 something paper, and for the last three years, it was fairly steady between 50 and 60 papers per year. And you know, as of yesterday, we had, I think, 26, 27 papers this year alone. So it's, it's a massive number of papers. And now it's interesting if we add up all these papers over the last uh, three years and three months and see how many of them appeared in classical machine learning outlets. Four. It's not a very good statistic. 
Um, so the rest of the papers appeared in, in uh, physics journals or, or other, other, other uh, journals which are not uh, machine learning or, or computer science, classical computer science. So let me continue with, with a bit of a history of, of how I got involved in, in all of this. I, got, I started thinking about um, problems in quantum machine learning exactly six years ago, in March 2012, uh, when I was visiting Barcelona for the first time. I was in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and I was developing machine learning algorithms for supercomputers. But then I ended up working with a physicist, and we started doing quantum simulations, and it was a lot of fun. So I, I started to dig up you know, whether there, anybody thought about doing uh, machine learning with, with quantum resources. And I found this paper, oh, not this one, sorry, <coughs> this one. Um, so this came out just two, two years before I, uh, before I started thinking about this problem. And this paper was really exciting. Um, and um, I started digging deeper and deeper and deeper. This paper is fairly hard to read if you're not a physicist. And then I found this one, which is by now 24 years old. I consider this as the first like, quantum enhanced machine learning paper. And, and I was full of, full of questions and I was very excited. You know, there were all these things. Like, it felt like nothing was like in classical machine learning. You couldn't even talk about supervised learning. There were all these strange paradigms popping up um, that you don't you normally focus on in classical machine learning, like active learning, transductive learning, generative modeling. And you know, there were just nobody really thought about like what model complexity would mean in, in a quantum setting, whether you can generalize uh, classical statistical learning theory to, to the quantum case, or you know, whether we can reduce sample complexity with, with some, some clever heuristic and, and beat standard quantum limit, because you are very limited in an IID setting in, in machine learning and the assumptions that go into that. And you know, there were all, the, all these questions that you know. Is, is a coherent protocol better for certain problems or incoherent? The trade-offs were not clear. So, so I, it was all very exciting and I kept thinking about it for about 15 months until this guy came around and you know, he brought his friends. And so these guys completely spoiled the game in 2013 because you know, they published these three papers on, on getting an exponential speed up in certain machine learning algorithms. And you know, until then, there were only a few papers on the subject. But after this, you know, it unleashed the wave of papers, and there was this very strong focus on speed up. And I was just not interested in speed up because there were all these other fun questions to, to answer and think about. And and I felt that you know the things for, things were getting derailed. And for instance, the way um, Seth and his colleagues were attacking the problem of, of support vector machines did not make any sense from a machine learning perspective because they were focusing on the least squares formulation, which gives you a maximally dense model. So you sort of lose the, the biggest benefit of support vector machines, which is sparsity. So I, I wanted to stop this process of like going this way. So that's why I started writing a book on it that, you know, we should, you know, there's more here and, and speed up is not everything. So maybe we could, we could focus on other problems as well. And I completely failed with this, with that, with this attempt because this is where we are today. So they told me to go to a specialist computer science journal just because I dared to, to use like state-of-the-art machine learning in a paper. And this was like the very ugly editorial rejection very recently. And so if you try to use actual cutting edge machine learning in a problem related to quantum physics, the burden is yours to explain what contemporary machine learning is about. And so we end up uh, with many, many quantum and machine learning papers where, where the main uh, message is that, hey, we can get this speed up. And uh, if you look at like, other scenarios, like, like this, you know, this, this classification of whether you have classical and quantum data and classical quantum algorithm, like the CC and QC papers, tend to focus a lot on like, low-hanging fruits. And, um, and I also find that you know, the state of the art in machine learning tends to be completely uncorrelated of what we do in, in quantum machine learning. So you know, it's, it's time to do something about that. So, so let's, let's talk about things we don't talk about. The most obvious one is state of the art in, uh, in classical machine learning and how it could relate to everything that we do in this community. 
then it's worth identifying the problems which are just notoriously hard to attack with classical methods. Because maybe that's, that's a room for quantum technologies to, to, to jump in. And then we really need to think about generalization performance because the perception of this is undergoing radical changes. So let's go through this. So the state of the art in classical machine learning, it's still mostly about backpropagation and it's amazing what you can do with, with uh, stochastic gradient descent alone. So there, there are like lots of lots of new results in creating generative models, they are getting better. Also semi-supervised models and reinforcement learning. So I did a quick search um, on uh, the submissions to iClear. iClear is the, the most prominent uh, machine learning um, conference for like high level theoretical research that has also practical outcomes. It's notoriously hard to get in, although it's, this conference series is only a few years old. And on, on just generative model, is there a pointer in this? Okay, good. Yeah, and you know, I got 100 results. For, for generative models. So mainly focusing about variants of uh, generative adversarial networks, which came out four years ago and they were numerically unstable and difficult to deal with for many years. But they are coming together, they are becoming more scalable. And you, know, you, would, you would get similar results if, uh, if, you, if you looked at these other, other um, problems where back propagation is advancing. And then there's a very clear move away from what you used to call, or what you still call, end-to-end -end, uh, learning. End-to-end -end learning means that you actually do only backpropagation. So it's just a gigantic neural network. And whatever task there is to solve, let that be just a um, simple supervised setting. Or reinforcement learning is just backpropagated from one end of the network to the other. And there's nothing else involved. So, these days we are starting to go back to these ideas of ensembles, like having different models, maybe different neural networks, and then combining them in non-trivial ways to have, say, reduced variance on the predictions. But you can also have functionally different neural networks solving different tasks, and then you have to combine them in, again, a non-trivial way to, uh, to handle complex tasks, say, that you face in, in robotics. And uh, you can also learn to learn. If many of you played around with deep learning networks. And you know, it's, it's a little bit of an annoying field to get into because there are so many rules of thumb and you don't know where they are going. But after you, after you play around with neural networks for two, three months, you get a sense of what it takes to, to work with those neural networks and what are the good hyperparameter choices. Now that's being automated. So that's, that, that's what it means learning to learn, that you finally find a clever way of optimizing over hyperparameters. So the burden is not yours, the burden is on the machine. So all of this is called meta-learning. And uh, it's, it's an emergent field within, within classical, classical machine learning. And so if you look at these problems, I think if you are working on, say, deploying neural networks on quantum medieval body physics, or if you are, if you are looking at uh, quantum control problems, then, then you should really, really check the, these results out. Then the next thing, the problems that classical machine learning struggles with. Um, so we, we, we made rapid advances in generative models, but there are still instability problems. Whereas if you look at probabilistic models, like the things that Alejandro is working on, and the things that you can do with, with sampling, let that be a, a quantum annealer or a universal quantum computer, um, you know, that's, those, are, those models are quintessentially probabilistic. They, they model some joint probability distribution, and it's completely orthogonal of what you can do with neural networks, and there can be advantages if you exploit them in a clever way. Um, unsupervised learning is really difficult to do with neural networks because there is nothing to backpropagate. And if there's no, you know, nothing to backpropagate, you can't train them. Again, like, can you rephrase generative learning models in a way that you can get some unsupervised representation back? It's a valid question. Explainability is huge. Um, DARPA has a huge uh, funding scheme for creating explainable AI. And uh, this year, the European Union um, enacts a regulation. Right? It was enacted, but you know, it, it kicks in. Uh, this year, where if an automated algorithm as a decision that has an impact on your life, then that algorithm must provide an explanation why it gave that prediction. So it's, it's, it's becoming 
a legal constraint on algorithms to give an explanation of what they are doing, and the neural network is, is, you know, has a disadvantage that it's just very, very difficult to explain why it arrives at a particular prediction. Again, if you are looking at probabilistic models, probabilistic inference, or, or formal reasoning, there could be an advantage for quantum resources. Same thing, same thing with confidence intervals, a neural network will not tell you how sure it is in a prediction. Never. Um, there, are, there is, uh, a, you know, a minority of researchers in the, in the classical machine learning community that look at uh, Bayesian methods and Bayesian neural networks. And um, so there could be a possibility that you can use quantum resources there to, to get some advantage. Again, I don't care about speed. I care about whether you can get confidence intervals. And uh, last, but not, last, uh, last but not least, uh, generalization performance. So the, like the theory of uh, statistical learning evolved over 30 years fairly rapidly, say the late 1960s until the mid-1990s. You know, we had this nice concept of probably, probably ex approximately correct learning. Then we have the Wapnit, Chavonenki's theory. And then it was quiet for, for a, few, a few years, uh, for a few decades, essentially. But over the last few years, people really want to understand that, you know, Deep learning networks go completely against the principles of statistical learning theory, but they work. Why is that the case? So uh, people started to rethink what generalization uh, performance means and how you can quantify it and how you can put statistical guarantees over it. So I highlighted two papers here. Um, uh, the, the first one is, is at iClear 2017. Um, it's well worth reading. It goes against this like it finally goes into an explanation that, you know, we know that if you regularize a neural network, it's just not going to work. You end up in some horrible local optimum. That's why you use these techniques like dropout and data augmentation and all of that. And it, it starts to explore ideas that why this is the case. It's just we have been looking at generalization performance uh, from, the, from their own perspective for a long time, and that is shifting now. And this paper, um, the second one, uh, just came out uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, it's by Yoshio Bengio. He creates a completely orthogonal theory of, of statistical learning to, to, to the Vatni Chabunenkis theory. It's based on, on measure theory and it factors in um, the difficulty of the problem that you're trying to solve to, to give you guarantees on generalization performance. So if you're looking in, uh, at, the, at the QQ scenario, so you are looking at uh, using quantum resources and quantum algorithms for, on quantum data, it's worth looking how you can use these new results in classical machine learning to say something there. And then I also want to talk about a couple of more things that we barely talk about, but we barely talk about it a little. Um, first of all, what about other quantum technologies? You know, so we mainly, we mainly focus on gate model, uh, quantum computers, and quantum annealers. But there's a whole lot of other stuff out there that you, know, you can either use it for learning or you can deploy some learning to, to make it work better. And then, <laughs> this is the two percent advantage. You know, you know um, what if you want to build a quantum machine learning startup? And in the panel uh, on Monday, uh, Andrew pointed out that you know, if you have a two percent advantage, that could be enough for, for a company to invest in quantum technologies. So I want to talk about these two topics a little bit more. Um, First of all, you can also look at a couple of these, these building blocks that go into build, um, constructing, say, a, a gate model quantum computer, a quantum annealer. There's a, there's a whole different uh, set of components that go into them, and each and every one of them could do better with some machine learning. Um, there was also a paper a couple of months ago on, on bootstrapping the control of a quantum computer by a quantum computer. So now you add reinforcement learning to that, and you have this wonderful virtuous cycle that, you know, by better uh, machine learning, you get more scalable quantum computers. And by better com uh, quantum computers, you get better machine learning algorithms. And, uh, well, there's already a startup for that. So um, then you can think about quantum simulators. Quantum simulators are, in, in many ways, are much easier to construct than gate model quantum computers or quantum annealers because you, you know in advance like what is the thing that you want to simulate. 
Um, so so there's, a, there's a, lo a lot of things that you can do here. Again, you can put reinforcement learning algorithms on top of classical or, or at least partially quantized. And then you can do all sorts of things like new material discovery, but there's also already a startup for, for that. And then you can think about uh, continuous variable systems and using them for various AI problems, but there happen to be a startup for that too. So it's worth thinking about these problems. There's actually academic and, and commercial in these directions. And so let me, let me talk a little bit more about this, this startup incubator program that I'm involved in. So the, the way it works is we recruit individuals from around the world, uh, physicists and computer scientists. We give them a training in, in machine learning, in data science, and also in particular quantum hardware that they get access to. At the moment, it's uh, DVF Systems and Rigetti who partnered with us. And uh, we also give them business guidance and we expose them to investors. And these investors are, are from Silicon Valley, but there's a, re there's a reason why they come up to Toronto. So in, in Silicon Valley, there is this unicorn mentality. Somehow the time horizon of investment is short. It's one or two years. So the invest investors that we got involved in this program have a much longer time horizon, five to 10 years. And so they are willing to keep adding uh, investments to a company beyond just one or two years. And because of that, you don't have this immediate time pressure that you must show quantum supremacy tomorrow. Um, so the companies that we're incubating have a bit more time and a bit more leeway. And yeah, as I mentioned, we, we give them access to, to quantum hardware. And in a moment, you will see, uh, we figured out that they also need access to, to uh, a fair amount of classical resources. So that's, that's the program. Um, and I want to give you a few examples of what these companies are doing. So there's, uh, there's one company called Protein Cure. Um, they do lattice-based protein folding. So what they do is they coarse grain the description of, of a long protein chain. Uh, and then they find the optimum configuration of this on a, on a DWAVE annealer. And once they have that optimum, then they post-process it with a classical supercomputer. And by that, they can reduce folding time from one week to one single day. And they use it for uh, um, discovering new, uh, new drugs, protein-based drugs, which in principle are non-toxic. Then we have Everettin. Um, they use the, the Rigetti computer. Oh, by the way. Um, Protein Q managed to crash one of the DVF computers. And I'm very proud of them because it has one of my master students. And Everett managed to, uh, to uh, crash the Rigetti quantum computer. So you know, it's, it's really fun to see that happening. So they use, yeah, they use this gate model, noisy gate model quantum computer to do all sorts of interesting things in, in probabilistic modeling. And they use these probabilistic models to reduce risk on, on financial assets. Uh, in particular, variance on the predictions of how uh, well that particular financial asset will perform. And then we have OTI Lumionics. Uh, it's, it's a startup that was not created in this program. It has been around for four or five years. Uh, but they were interested in how they can integrate quantum simulations in, in their material design pipeline. And they figured a way that you know, once they arrive at some uh, hard tree fork uh, approximation in the, in the quantum chemistry simulations that they are doing, then from there, they can take the description and embed it on, on DWIV or, uh, or on the Rigetti computer to do some optimization and help them with, uh, with the material discovery cycle that they have in place. Again, there was this massive reduction of time that it takes them to find new, new materials. They build uh, uh, organic light emitting diodes. So all of this, uh, so protein Q and Everettian are, are seed stage, so they are raising a small amount of money in a few months. And uh, OTI Luminex is going for a series B. And by adding, adding this, this quantum technology into their pipeline, they can raise a much better uh, series B than they, they would be able to do without it. So they, again, have a lot, of, lot more elbow room just because of this. Um, and here are a couple of problems that these startup, uh, startups faced. We recruited maybe 75% physicists and mathematicians and, uh, and engineers and 25% classical computer scientists and, and machine learning people. 
And it turned out that the problems that they were facing are, were mainly, mainly of computer science nature. So the companies that are now among, say, the top five or seven, we have about 14 companies at the moment. So in, in the, say, the top five, six, seven, are the ones who, who have a hacker on board, who can build stuff, a software engineer, who knows how to build a product from scratch. And, uh, and uh, of course, there's a physicist involved as well, because you have to understand at this point what you can do with the hardware. It's non-trivial. But you need that computer scientist on board to be able to build something that you can demonstrate and that you can raise money on. Um, and we also realized that um, the companies need classical computing power because anything they do is, is maximum 5% quantum. The rest, the rest of it is, say, for protein cure, for this protein folding, is just Amazon Web Services. They just keep burning thousands of dollars on folding proteins. And so they need the quantum, or the, you know, they have to be quantum ready. But most of the calculations are done on, on, on classical clusters and GPUs. Um, and we also found that there is this like, huge mismatch between uh, the problem, problems that people want to solve and, and the quantum machine learning available. So uh, you will see in a couple of months papers coming out, at least five papers coming out of these companies, of how they had to twist uh, quantum machine learning algorithms to fit actual problems that they want, want to see. So there will be a good range of papers this year coming out of these companies. And, and this, this question, whether is it too early for incubating the startup, came up on Monday and also in yesterday's uh, panel's discussion. And um, I think there are a couple of things uh, here. So timing is critical. If you do it in four years' time, when, when quantum technologies will be a lot more mature, and a lot more predictable, then it will be already too late because then there will be somebody doing a, a similar incubator program in Silicon Valley. So the time is now to, to get these like, you know, low-hanging fruits and establish a center for incubating these startups somewhere in the world, and it happens to be Toronto. Um, and what I find in the, in the quantum community or quantum info community that it's, it's surprisingly small. And you, you might not realize that there's a huge world out there. So, I mean, look at this conference. There are maybe 70 participants. And a classical machine learning conference has 1,000 papers published and four or 5,000 people attending. And that's, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So there's, there's room out there. So if you want to do some application of quantum machine learning, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a question of, hey, but there are all these classical machine learning algorithms and there's no room for quantum. That's not true. There's just plenty of possible applications for, for any technology that you want to develop in, in a startup scenario. And um, so going back to Andrew's point, you know, a 2% advantage is enough for, for instance, a logistic company if they want to um, uh, reduce, say, say the, the fuel consumption of their fleet. Uh, a 2% advantage is probably not enough for a startup. You are looking at more like a 20, 30% advantage over whatever uh, figure of merit you have in, in, in mind. But if you have that and you can promise that in five years, that's enough. So it's, it's a very weak form of quantum supremacy that this program is fishing for. But that's, I think that's realistic. So that's about the companies. So um, this is my vision of the headquarters of the future Institute of Quantum Machine Learning. Um, it's already built. It's in Warsaw. But maybe we can transport it somewhere else. You know, it, it's a beautiful, rigid building that intimidates anyone who wants to enter. Um, so I'm familiar with, with most, uh, most of the work, well, not most of the work, but some of the work of, of what most of you are doing. And, and I could pick at least one example, but probably more example from the work of all of you that I think it, it, uh, it hits a sweet spot. It hits a sweet spot in terms of depth in both machine learning and in quantum physics. And I th what I try to get across is that we need more of this. We need to factor in a lot more of what's happening in, in classical machine learning, because if we don't do that, we miss out a lot of fantastic opportunities. And we should, we should act on it now before, before we move into the headquarters of this wonderful building. So I, I finish up with a couple of advertisements. Um, first of all, we are recruiting the second cohort for our startup incubator program. 
apply, and it's fantastic. Um, then uh, this morning, our proposal was accepted for a classical machine learning conference. It's one of the big four. Um, so it's going to happen in, in August, and the submission deadline is uh, 8th of May. It's unfortunately a half-day workshop, so we have to compress everything that was set here in a week into just four hours. So I'm not sure how we will manage that, but anyway, the call will be up in a few days. And uh, plus, I also want to say about uh, uh, say a few words about this uh, um, call for papers in, in uh, the journal Plus One. Uh, Fabio mentioned it uh, in his talk. So this is about promoting openness and especially open source software in uh, in quantum physics. So in, in machine learning, when I was doing my PhD, um, it was unheard of that you would publish your code. Like, why would you do that? Uh, since then, over the last four or five years, it became standard. So people always publish some code with the paper that they, uh, that they, that they publish to maximize impact and to help graduate students to understand what goes on in the paper and you know, they can take it from there. And I would love to see the same thing in quantum physics. Um, it's, it's good for early stage scientists because you build a portfolio and once you get to the point of graduation, you will be able to choose whether you want to stay in academia or whether you want to pursue a career in industry. And to make it really a choice and not something forced, you should have values or you should provide something that is valuable in a commercial enterprise. And for instance, if you can prove that you can, you can code and you have this profile on GitHub, for instance, that's, that's terribly valuable. Um, so that's about it. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, we got one. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for this talk. This was really, really refreshing. <laughs> so, um, I just, so I just like would um, speak against one point you made quite mm -hmm. heavily, and that is that um, you criticised that we're not connected enough to classical um, machine learning research, and I think this is actually the wrong way around. I think we are connected too much to it. Maybe not the state of the art anyways, but like the models that they give us in the textbooks, mm -hmm. uh, and too little to classical machine learning researchers, like as people. And um, so the reason is if you take a GAN and try to make it quantum, I think this is, your brain just shuts down and there's nothing good that can, can come out of that. If you take like ideas, from people, from the practices and the lessons they learned, and you create something completely new that is quantum machine learning. I think this might be something that is actually worth contributing to the machine learning community. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And, and I'm not saying that you should take it again and quantize it. That, that's a terrible way to think about it. So I think well, all I'm saying is, um, is that uh, when, you, when you create a quantum machine learning algorithm, then, then you should be aware, for instance, these open problems in machine learning which, which are hard and focus on those. Because there's, there's uh, you know, little value in, in creating a new support vector machine that cannot even be implemented, right? Okay, uh, any other questions? Oh, okay. Thank you for your fantastic talk. And uh, there's one thing I was wondering is the relationship between the quantum machine learning technology and the quantum computing or com uh, quantum computers. Uh, in other words, I mean, uh, there were how, how these two technologies were influenced to each other's, or, or I mean, well, the quantum machine learning technology will stimulate the, the, the progress to the quantum computer or in the contrary way. I, this, this is my, my, my favorite topic. Um, I, I, I believe that uh, the influence goes uh, two ways. So it, it's going to be advantages for, for both, uh, both, you know, both fields. And, and so far, it's not happening. So you know, this virtuous cycle of self-improvement is at the moment blocked. And uh, I, would, I would love to see that it move forward uh, in that direction, that this interaction becomes two ways. Okay. Uh, well, I guess we should then. Thank that you. That was great. Thank you.